we finished up uh, with the firestorms and the uh, the intense fires possibly coming from the skies, but we got a little more maybe to go on that, maybe some more about the about ancient stories uh, and more of the dragon symbols. Right, Randall, is that the direction we're going to take Yeah, here? the thing you got to understand, Russ, is we will never be through with that ah. story. <laughs> well, that's but, a good thing, I think. But we have covered the basics. So enough, I think, for... Just uh, the basics. People. Yeah. October but, 8th happens every year. Yeah, it does, and it's going to continue. But uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, dove into that interesting dimension of our history that a lot of folks were not aware of before uh before this and hopefully now a few more of them will be aware of it and uh consider it as a serious a realistic possibility you know i was i've been i'm still skeptical like is this pot even possible well i mean it's possible but you know we got to come up with some kind of an explanation to me the extraordinary thing i guess is that it 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 suggests a, a, a process that nobody has really considered, except right. in very limited. I mean, look, let's face it. Where did this idea first come from? Came from Ignatius Donnelly, right? Yeah. To my knowledge, he was the first one to ever make a connection between the Chicago fire, the Peshtigo fire, and the potential cosmic impact. Although he thought that it was perhaps um, debris coming from the disintegration of Comet Biala. Whereas no one mentioned it, as far as I know, until I looked at the obvious, which is, well, is there a meteor stream October 8th? And to discover the Draconids was, well, by gosh, there is. I mean, so it's like when you pose these questions, yeah, then you seek the answers to them. So, yeah, there is a meteor. And then you find out that it was in, in times past a very prominent meteor storm that actually has a lot of fireballs associated with it. Yeah. And then you go, wait a second. But how is it that this meteor stream is called the Draconids because of the constellation of Draco, the dragon? And here we are with the ancient lore. And I thought maybe we could get into dive into some of that as, sure. uh, you know, serpent lore and dragon lore, that kind of stuff. And I think that one of the first places we could go is like right to the, um, oh, just to the, like to the Bible, because this is the thing we're all brought up with the Bible in the Western culture. And I mean, if you come back to the biblical stories with this, perhaps this perspective that maybe, you know, what's the, what, 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 up to this point, if you look at the biblical stories, it, it, they kind of suffer the same fate as mythology in general amongst the scientific community, which is that these are just, Stories that are, are are no more have no more basis in reality, say, than typical myths from anywhere and everywhere, right? And then, if you're a true believer, if you're a, a, a Christian, and you're particularly the evangelical persuasion or fundamentalist, like a you don't yeah. need any scientific explanation for anything that's there. It's all miraculous and supernatural, right? So, if you read, if you turn to St. Matthew chapter 4, verse 29, and it reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Well, this is something that can happen literally, both through impact events and volcanic events, right? So anytime there would have been a major volcanic event or an impact event that could have triggered wildfires or uh, resulted in the accretion of cosmic dust to the earth. And here we could get into talking about some of the work of Fred Hoyle and early work of Chandra Wickramasinghe and their uh, ideas about what happens when the earth accretes to it cosmic dust, um, which can, of course, change the, the not only the albedo of the earth's atmosphere, but also the transparency of the earth's atmosphere. So, you know, you, you can look at it, that particular verse and you can say immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light? Well, if you're, if, if you're not trying to uh, see any kind of a scientific context to, to these verses, well, you know, you're, you, it doesn't matter. It's not, it, it's just something mythical, basically. If you're a believer, you don't need a scientific explanation because it's, 
it's God. It's the handiwork of God. It's supernatural. It's miraculous, whatever. However, then you read it in the very next sentence, and I think right there, the author of this is, is, is putting the pieces together in such a way that, that it's just obvious. It's in your face. What it actually is the source behind this quote, because then it says, after, the, uh, after it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, oh, yeah, and the man. powers of the heavens shall be shaken. If, if we look, okay, and try to see this through the lens of what somebody 2,500 years ago or 3,000 years ago, how they're interpreting natural events, but natural events on a totally different scale, the cosmic scale. I mean, this actually is perfectly, a perfectly rational sounding statement, actually. Now, when we look at this, you know, instead of saying, well, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give up her light. Well, we just use a different terminology, terminology now. We talk about the opacity of the atmosphere. We say, you know, in scientific terms that the opacity of the atmosphere shall be increased, right? But the, the, the most direct consequence of that to an observer on the ground is that the sun is darkened and the moon shall not give up her light. But it's the... My point is, maybe we're talking about the same thing. From the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation, otherwise known as the Apocalypse. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the earth and cast it into the earth. So right there, what, is, what kind of picture does that invoke? That's not just an ordinary, I mean, I, I'd say that's a sensor on a scale that's probably several orders of magnitude beyond the one that was being used in the rituals that Mike saw yeah. and participated in. And in fact, is that possibly some vision of this kind of a process ultimately at the core of the symbolism here? So the angel took the sensor, <laughs> filled it with the fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up starting to sound a little bit like uh hmm, yeah. what might have happened at the younger driest boundary sounds like tunguska yep. sounds like tunguska revelation 1821 right listen to this and the mighty angel, so these angels, damn, these angels, they must have it in for us. And the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Wow. Well, I that mean. Sounds familiar. It sounds like. Okay, a bolide impact into an ocean, a yep. big tsunami, boom, some great city wiped out and shall be found no more at all. Now, this is, this is nothing that is so implausible that it needs to be strictly confined to the realm of fantasy, right? It's just all in how we interpret those words, but within the context of things that we know happen. And we know, I think we can safely say with confidence, if these happened and were experienced by people, these events are going to be the kinds of events that imprint themselves indelibly into the human psyche and form the basis of myths and legends and tall tales and folklore and get handed down and handed down. Why is this such an unreasonable assumption? In fact, I would take the converse. I would say the unreasonable assumption is to just make the blanket belief that no, such a transmission of human experience is not possible and couldn't happen. And therefore, this legacy of these traditions, these religious beliefs and, and, and rituals and ceremonies and myths and all of this stuff has no meaning you know, beyond the superficial. That beyond that, behind there, at the core of this, at the foundation level, at the basement level of this stuff that we're not really seeing is this whole other order of experience 
that's left its imprint on human consciousness and has come down to us in terms of these archetypal visions, because every religion has, has its parallels to what I've just read here. So where does that come from? Is it just born out of some vacuum of human uh, cognition or consciousness, or is there something there that our ancestors experienced and has now essentially fueled this these images, these visions, these traditions, these prophecies, whatever. Maybe prophecies are simply the awareness of the grand cycles. That guy is the prophet, see? <laughs> but what is his prophecy? He just knows the side. Anybody who was still around, whose memory was not erased, would be a prophet. How about this? Now think about the stories we've been telling over the last four or five episodes. And this is right out of the book of the Hopi. So the people went down to live with the ant people. When they were all safe and settled, Teowa commanded Sotuchanang to destroy the world. He rained fire upon it. Fire came from above and below and all around until the earth, the waters, the air was all one element, fire. And there was nothing left except the people safe inside the womb of the earth. Now, given what we know now, are we going to just assume, oh, this is just some exaggerated myth or, or is it really referring to a, a, a tradition about the ancestors of the modern Hopi actually surviving some type of enormous cataclysmic ecperusis type event by going underground? But you see, we're one of the things that we're kind of now straight jacketing this kind of a discussion is that, and we're going to run into this, and anyone who up to this point is pursuing catastrophic models of Earth history, is that these run counter to the dogmas and the agendas of some very powerful factions right now that have a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of true believers behind them that wants to divert the discussion away from natural global change to focus exclusively on anthropogenic global change being caused by an enhancement of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And it has billions of dollars behind it. And so what that is now attempting to do, but not succeeding, is monopolize the conversation about global change. Because if we accept the fact that both from the scientific realm, empirical data, theoretical data about the past history of this planet. And then we look at this incredible global legacy of stories and traditions that have come down to us and realize that these two, two ways of perceiving the world are perfectly complementary. And suddenly we realize that, yes, we live on this extraordinarily dynamic planet that has undergone all kinds of upheavals of on every front that civilizations have arisen and collapsed over and over again, right? But we don't want to really be paying attention to that. You see, this is, it necessarily gets political. When, for, for anybody who's expounding a, a catastrophist model of Earth history is going to run up against that wall. Right, and you can't really avoid it. And, but the wall has a lot of cracks in it big cracks, major cracks. So I'm kind of thinking that that wall might be like a, a, our modern version of the Berlin Wall. And it could come crashing down any day uh, when we realize, hey, you know what? We've created this amazing civilization that is now encompassing the planet within one of the intervals, the natural intervals of relative quiet, with relative low-level events. But what we've seen from the natural record, from the record of natural history of the planet, is that these episodes are regularly and repeatedly punctuated by catastrophic global events. And see, that puts the whole per a different perspective on things than 
See, and right now, everything is internalized. You know, the enemy is the Russians or the Chinese or whoever. Not the fact that we're all, regardless of our political affiliation, religious beliefs, ethnicity, gender, race, any of that, none of that matters because within the big picture of global change, we're all going to be, that's the great equalizer, if you want to put it that way. And it will erase the significance of all of these other variations that are being used for to advance various agendas that are keeping us apart because of superficial things. You see, that's the point, I think, is that understanding this model of global change that is actually indisputably now being presented through the scientific model and completely reinforced and supported and, and confirmed through the traditional archaic model is that, yeah, we can sit there and do whatever we want, but nature's going to kick our fuck. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. And and all of the things that we put in place up to this point in, aren't going to amount to anything, you see. And that one of these natural events, these catastrophic natural events, can affect more environmental change by orders of magnitude than anything we've done. Do you think that there's anything that the human species have done, whether it's through our history of agriculture, through industrialization, do you think that 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 would anywhere even approach the geomorphic remodeling of this planet that occurred during the transition out of the Ice Age? Is there anything that we've done that would be the equivalent of a 400-foot rise in sea level? Is there anything that we've done that that would be the equivalent of drowning? several million square miles of continental land? Is there anything that we've done that would be the equivalent of, say, 7 million square miles or more, 8 million, maybe 9 million when you include Eurasia, of of landmass getting swallowed up in ice sheets a 1,000 feet thick up to 2 miles thick? Here's my point. What have we done yet that would even come close to that in in terms of its imprint on on the planet? See, that's my point. We have another event like that. This entire thing that we've done here, this entire drama of building modern civilization, it's gone. It's done. 10,000 years from now, the archaeologists will be arguing, well, you know, there was nothing going on back then because where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? Well, when you start thinking about mega floods, mega fires like we've been talking about, we haven't talked about some of the volcanic eruptions that occurred during the transition out of the ice age or some of the seismic events that may have approached 10 and 11 in the Richter scale. We haven't even talked about that, you know, because of the deglaciation, you had major tectonic movements. Well, see, we could get, and and that's the idea of what we're trying to do with this podcast, but a realistic working model of this planet we inhabit has to include the fact that there have been repeated countless catastrophes, some that on the upper scale, yeah, are wiping out three quarters of all species on plant, the planet. Others, which may not even cause a, a, a barely an, a, a species extinction level event, but would still be fully capable of destroying civilization. We aren't the pinnacle of human civilization. We're just the most recent version of it in, you know, the most recent calm period. Yes. That that's really uh, I see. And here's the thing. This is not some pseudoscientific idea. Right. It's an idea that should be entertained seriously. The formation of the Columbia Basalt Plateau itself. Right. We could go on. So, you know, David Alt speculated that maybe there was a major impact 17 million years ago. Well, this see, we can be talking about episodes of volcanism, episodes of seismicity, geomagnetic field reversals and fluctuations. This is controversial, but it's certainly a possibility. The climate change, obviously, mass extinctions. It it turns out there's a whole lot of phenomena that maybe up to now or within the last generation, the thought has been it's a purely uh, terrestrial phenomena. But a lot of these things may have a celestial component, uh, even a celestial trigger you see welcome 
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to po- Cosmographia Podcast. Um, we're still going to continue on this, uh, I guess, this train of thought and the um, serpent and dragon symbols throughout the ancient world. Get on back to serpents. Serpents. <laughs> yeah. Now, you dragons. guys, there's something, let's see, what is it? There's some kind of affinity or affiliation you guys have, isn't there? With there is an Ophidian affiliation. That's yeah. right. An Ophidian affiliation. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. All right. Yeah, hmm. I'm. Uh, we've all been fascinated by the by the serpent symbols throughout uh, mm-hmm. the ages oh, yeah. and and the prominence. You know, yeah, the in prominence. all the myths yeah. of the yeah. serpent. So the Ouroboros, it, the cycles of time, and I, I know. don't know. That's just yeah. Yeah, so we'll have to dive into that Ouroboros symbol at some point. Dan nice, I hadn't seen that. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, yeah, you want to tell us a little more about that? What's that? The Brothers of the Serpent. Is that a historical kind of deep group of some sort? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is, you know, legendary, but it's, you know, does it exist? Probably, maybe. You know, Graham hints at it, a monastic order of people who occasionally inject information into civilization into humanity to keep to restart civilization after during the wasteland i yeah. suppose yeah yeah so uh yeah the, the the serpent in the bible is an interesting character yeah definitely and i kind of don't think that they've the identity of that serpent i think has kind of been overlooked I think there's more to that symbol than meets the eye there. Sure, yeah. And it's associated with, you know, with knowledge. Of yeah. course, the, in the Egyptian tradition, this, um, you know, it's the, on the caduceus, the serpent. Yep. Right. And what does the serpent say then at that point? For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, what's going to happen? Your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as the gods. Yeah, that was the problem. That was the problem. I, yeah. I find that extremely interesting to ponder. It's it's like Promethean in a way, right? This Very is much so, of, yes. Yeah. Then what happened? What happened after that? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Yeah. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And after she ate, what did she then do? She gave also unto her husband and he did eat. Like, hey, hey, Adam, you got to try this. <laughs> yeah. But then what happened? So they both ate of the fruit. Did they die? No. No. Seventh verse. What does it say? The eyes of them both were opened. So what did the serpent say? The serpent said, in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Yeah. What did God say? No. Well, now bear in mind, this isn't God. This is the Lord. This is Jehovah in the Hebrew text. It's not Elohim. It's Jehovah. So this is interesting to me because, see, it's, it's it, in this simple-minded version of Christianity, all of these things like the serpent, the devil, Satan, the beast, um, Lucifer, all of these things are conflated. Right. Right? But is the serpent really the same as Satan? Is the serpent the same as Lucifer? And who is Lucifer? Who is Satan? See, the problem is, is to me, is that these are symbols for things, for concepts, for principles, for properties, for events, maybe. I don't think, and see, the problem is, is we're given a false choice. Either you just accept this whole thing again, supernaturally, in which case it has to have no consistency with reason or logic or knowledge in in particular. On the other hand, if you take the scientific worldview, then this is basically just superstition and, and has no 
valid meaning relative to the to reality as we know it. But then to, I would say, the initiate, what makes and distinguishes an initiate from the population at large is that the initiate looks at something like this and realizes that these are symbols and these symbols are conveying a deeper meaning. And then, I mean, what does the eighth verse say? After, after this, after they've eaten and their, their, their eyes have been opened, then what happens? Well, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, that's interesting. Walking in the garden. Now, so anyways, there's more to this. And I think it's, it's actually worth going into deeper. And really, you have to go in, I think, to the original language. You have to go back into the original classical Hebrew that it was written in. And then I think that perhaps we can peel some of the literary veneer back and see the, the underlying meaning that's being conveyed by this imagery. If you say the Lord God, you're actually saying the God Jehovah. Now, if you look at it that way, suddenly you've got a whole different perspective on the biblical story. But that was not necessarily going to be the subject matter of what we talked about tonight, but in some ways it connects because we are talking about serpents and dragons. And of course, one of the most prominent serpents in the Western tradition is the biblical serpent. And I think what we tried to show just by repeating these verses right out of King James is that perhaps there might be some other layer of meaning, some other uh, interpretation as to the identity of the serpent. And then the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And uh, the woman said, uh, well, uh, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. But remember what her motive was? Let's go back and look. The motive, remember, the motive was uh, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. And most importantly, a tree to be desired to make one wise. So she committed the crime of seeking wisdom. It sounds to me like, by the way, the serpent is Nachash, Nachash, Nunchet Shin in the Hebrew, which once we kind of peel that back and take a deeper look into that, I think we'll see some interesting connections. And I, I think we should probably circle back to that in an upcoming, maybe even the next episode of this that we do. Um, because in, it, since we've, we've opened up this can of worms on discussing the serpent, the great dragon, um, I think there's some important clues here. But in order to um, extract that information from this narrative, we're going to have to go into Oh, into some, some sideline areas like Kabbalah and look at some of the numbers that are behind these words and names and phrases. Oh, man. And so, that sounds great. Now, if we realize that the serpent is on one level now, and, and, and I'm not, one of the things I want to do here is when you get into these things that we will call, oh, euphemistically, the occult, in, in, uh, in quotation marks, the occult, basically just meaning things that are unknown to, uh, you know, mainstream thought, that stuff that tends to be hidden and outside the, the, the regular discourse of reality, if you want to put it that way. So when you look at this and realize that there are layers of meaning and the objective almost is the contrast of science, where what you're trying to do in modern science is you're trying to narrow as much as possible, restrict a specific meaning, and give a term, a scientific term, what, what constitutes a scientific term, is not its, its protean nature that it can be interpreted in multiple different ways, but its specificity. How narrow of a meaning can you give to a specific term? And so there's a whole lexicon that emerges to cover every variant of meaning that might apply to some body of empirical 
or theoretical knowledge. We certainly see it in geology, that everything has its very precise terminology. Whereas occultism is like the opposite of that. A, a symbol is considered a, a, a vehicle for conveyance. And there can be layered meanings conveyed in that symbol. And in fact, the more meanings there are implicit within a symbol, the more powerful it is. And so because we interpret the serpent according to one particular strata of meaning doesn't include, exclude the possibility of there being other layers of meaning. What is often a goddess, a woman associated with what? Nature. Mm. Nature, yes. Earth. Earth, yes. Yes, absolutely. Earth. Planet Earth. Yes. And if we think about this, reference to the woman as being a stand-in, at least on one level, for Earth, we might begin to see the glimmerings of a possible interpretation, alternate interpretation here. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. He now goes through all this, you know, cursing the serpent, um, then putting enmity between thee and the woman. Okay. Think about if the woman can actually be interpreted on one level as a symbol for the earth. And all throughout mythology, we find the earth being represented in almost all cases as a female. As a mother, yeah. As a mother, right. In our alternate trans translation, I will say it this way. And the God Jehovah said, now listen carefully to what follows. Now this is the King James English. Behold, the man is become as one of us. Right there. Yeah, who's that us? Behold, the man is become as one of us. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden cherubims or cherubims. Now that is an interesting word to dive into. East of the Garden of Eden, cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Interesting stuff, isn't it? Revelation 12, verse 7, verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Back in 1982, Victor Klub and Bill Napier, who you guys are well aware of who they are, the British astronomer, astrophysicist, who've been doing the work on catastrophism and comets, uh, particularly comets. And you know that Bill Napier, um, you know, he has contributed papers linking the Younger Dryas impact event with the Torrid meteor stream. Very important paper written by, by Napier. 1982, Victor Klub and Bill Napier, the title of the book, The Cosmic Serpent, A Catastrophist View of Earth History. The earliest recorded myths are those of combat between a god or hero and a dragon. The dragon was a familiar figure in Greece, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Babylon, India, China, North America, and elsewhere. He is a gigantic monster. He spouts fire and smoke, bellows and hisses. He throws rocks and is the creator of terrible destruction and his home is in the sky. 
Now, if we go back and remember, try to recall, you know, some of the eyewitness accounts from the Tunguska event of 1908, you could almost take some of those eyewitness accounts and plug this, these verses two through four from the second chapter of Acts right in to those eyewitness descriptions of what happened with the Tunguska event and its aftermath in 1908. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. I can't help but thinking of some of the uh, stories from the Peshtigo and Hinkley fires. And now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Remember what happened in the aftermath of Tunguska when the, in the, the nearby village, the people ran out into the street. I showed the, the slide of the great Leonid meteor shower, everybody running out into the street, the, the hiding. They were bending over, uh, covering their heads because they thought that the, that the meteors were going to be striking them in the head, thinking again that the world was uh, ending. So we've seen over and over again in these narratives that people experiencing these cosmic events think it's apocalyptic, think it's Armageddon, think it's the end of the world. We saw that repeatedly just in the stories of the great mega fires, the Ekperusis fires that we've been exploring uh, in the last, uh, whatever, five episodes. Uh, from the first Kings, uh, chapter 19, verses 11 through 12. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. And after the wind, an earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. I don't know. Sounds like it could be talking about an impact event to me. Is it possible that this could be referring to a meteor storm, a series of impacts, an impact, a single impact, multiple impacts? I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Next verse, and the stars of heaven fell unto earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Sounds to me like it's talking about a multi-impact event. Psalm 76. I mean, you realize, my God, this Bible is full of catastrophism. Yes. Mm, I think arrows might actually turn out to be one of the more regular symbols or images invoked. And we can actually make, I think, a strong case for arrows, swords. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world, the earth trembled and shook. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Nevertheless, we... And this is the secret of the grail right here. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Diabolos comes from Diabolo, from which it derives the means to traduce or to accuse. But let's not stop there. Let's keep pushing back into the etymological origins. We see that Diablo 
is made up of two more primitive words, dia, D-I-A, which is a primary preposition, meaning through, through. And balo, balo is a verb which has a collection of meanings according to the use and the context. But among these meanings, here's what we find. It means to throw. To throw more or less violently. It also means to cast down. It also means synonyms here from the Greek. To cast out, to pour, to strike, to throw down, to send down. A variant of the word diabolo is diabano or diobiano, which is a word that means to cross over. Dia, a variant of the word dis, dis, which is connected with the word Zeus. And in fact, in some variations, the two are almost interchangeable. The word dis interestingly, turns out to be an obsolete form of the name of the supreme deity of the Greeks, which we render in its modern form as Zeus. Zeus, the same deity known to the Latin as Jove or Jupiter. Jove, aha, uh -huh. Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Integrating some of these meanings renders an alter altogether different picture of the devil than the conventional view, right? Now let's pause for a minute there and think back to a myth where someone, an offspring of the gods, one of the gods went astray, right? Who was that? Who went astray and set the world on fire? Maybe Phaeton. Phaeton, yeah. Phaeton, yes. Plano, planeo, to Rome. Okay, so this word deceiveth actually goes back and has these root meanings of to stray, which can mean straying from orthodoxy, but it also means to roam or to cause to roam, to go astray. Now, it can be to go astray from virtue or truth, certainly. It can also mean to wander. So what was the nature if we go back, this is like planet. The, uh, the word planos, yeah, or yeah. planos, however, gave rise to another closely related word whose meaning may more nearly suggest the original intent of the author of Revelation. Planetes, planetes, which comes from that, a rover, planet is erratic and wandering. Wandering, wandering stars. stars. Yeah, exactly. Wandering stars. Uh-huh. So when you probe into these things, you can kind of peel back these layers and realize that there might be whole other meanings um, concealed therein. And then, of course, what is Zeus known for? Hurling well, thunderbolts. Yeah, thunderbolts, yes. From the book, The Romance of Comets by Mary Proctor, written in 1926. I love to go back to some of this older stuff where some of these people are speculating uh, without being hamstrung by or being overly dogmatic. Comets have sometimes been pictured as dragons. And according to Pliny, the shape of a comet indicated its character as a portent. Thus, some were shown as arrowheads. I called attention to several references to arrows, to arrowheads, sea monsters, swords, lances, and flames. In AD 69, according to Josephus, several signs appeared in the sky announcing the destruction of Jerusalem. And here is the quote from, from Pliny, from jo Josephus. Amongst other warnings, a comet, one of the kind called Xiphius, Xiphius, because their tails appear to represent the blades, the blade of a sword, was seen above the city for a space of a whole year. Lance, right? 
arrows, the blade of a sword. Here's from a European chronicle set down around 1000 AD, quoted in Proctor, the same book, uh, and quoted by Carl Sagan in his book on comets. The heavens having opened a kind of, and here we have now the introduction of yet another symbol of this kind of phenomena. The heavens having opened, a kind of burning torch fell upon the earth leaving behind it a long train of light, similar to a flash of lightning. Such was its light that it frightened not only those who were in the open country, but those who were within doors. As this opening in the heavens slowly closed, men saw with horror the figure of a dragon, whose feet were blue and whose head seemed continually to increase. These are some interesting forms when you start looking at them. I like the showing that, you know, these multiple tails, and there's a remarkable similarity. Maybe you guys pointed this out. Remarkable similarity between these Chinese depictions of comets and some of the petroglyphs we see yeah. in the Southwest. That was, that was Peter pointed that out. That was Peter, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting association there uh, to me. Because, yeah, you see almost some of the, the figures etched into oh. these walls, pecked into the walls, are very yeah. similar to what we're looking at right very here. Very similar, absolutely. Yes. Now, when you Amazing. see a spear made out of meteoritic iron, and it's got those symbols carved in it, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Very suggestive. <laughs> it looks like the one on the lower right of the blade is a serpent. It does, yeah. doesn't it? And and then look at this. Let me see it right here. Is oh, this yeah. is that possibly showing like fragmentation? A, a, a fragmentation event? The Elohim. Mm-hmm. Mm huh. The point here is we could go on and we'll find an interesting, very interesting correlation to me. That oftentimes events that are would normally be considered exclusively terrestrial, even droughts, but earthquakes, right? Other climatic and weather phenomena often are associated with meteor showers and impact type events. Hmm. It's a good time to wind it down. Okay, let me, let me close with this. This is now from actually a uh, NASA website I'm talking about comets. Comets have inspired dread, fear, and awe in many different cultures and societies around the world. And throughout time, they have been branded with such titles as the harbinger of doom and the menace of the universe. They have been regarded both as omens of disaster and messengers of the gods. Why is it? that comets are some of the most feared and venerated objects in the night sky. Why did so many cultures cringe at the sight of a comet? Well, I don't think we have to reach too far to come up with the answer to that. So how interesting. God takes two stars from Kima, throws them at the earth, and that's what begins the Great Flood. Then you have the Yakut... <clears throat> A cluster of stars. A cluster of stars. Ah. Any specific cluster of stars? Ooh, I bet I know which one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pleiades. Mm-hmm. Took a couple of stars out of the Pleiades, threw them at the earth, and that's what started the Great Flood. That day. Wow. And the Pleiades is, of course, the shoulder of the bull. So anyways, I want to close with a image, but let's just take a brief moment to summarize some of the imagery that we have associated with the comet in our little discourse during this class. Swords, lances, torches, that's a prominent one, brooms, what else? Serpents, dragons. Serpents, dragons were clearly the most prominent. And then the literal meaning of the word comata itself, 
long haired. Oh, yes. And remember the associated with the symbol of mourning. Mourning, not mourning like AM, but mourning. It's sad. Yeah. Sad. Yes. So now I want to look at this picture that's very prominent within Freemasonry. We'll, we'll, of course, be coming back to this image because I think it's so interesting and suggestive. Hmm. Something else that we didn't cover in this particular discussion mm. was the uh, the usage of a, the, the the representation of the of the uh, fireball or the comet as a scythe or a sickle. Yeah. And but again, the idea there is it not only gives the appearance of a sickle in the sky, particularly the of the long curved tail, but the idea of you know the God reaching in and harvesting the earth by means mm -hmm. of the scythe. And notice this is the God Saturn or time. And what's he doing? He's, he's plating or bla braiding the long hair of this mourning woman in her right hand. She holds the acacia branch in her left hand. Look what she's got. The, the sensor. sensor, the sensor. Yes. On the broken column is an open book, and there's your broken column. Right here, down inconspicuous, inconspicuously, is the hourglass marking the passage of time. Hmm. And when you start putting us all together, what comes up here is not some superstitious figure of ancient, illiterate human imagination, but something I think profoundly meaningful. The other interpretation of the of the sensor in her hand is also when you remove the top, you've got the chalice. It's the grail, yeah. It's yes. the grail, yes. And also, it's interesting how how the the way he's holding her hair kind of represents the breaking up of the comet and the yes. tail. Yeah, they're and in the two tail. different there directions. And yeah, of course, he's bearded, which is also another you know these yes the bearded yeah stars. bearded yep. The bearded, exactly. Awesome stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic, Randall. Great. Oh, thanks, Great guys. Show. Delivering more than expected once again. I was just looking at the Ace of Swords too. Well, maybe we could look at that next time. Well, let's we'll pick up with that next time. Let's do. I think that would be because yeah, we've got a lot more here. All right, we this could easily keep stuff. going for another hour. And I, I love these these old accounts. Oh man, yeah, yeah, yeah. more lore, more lore. Brad, yeah, excellent. Anything we want to add? All the stuff will be in the show notes. Randallcarlson dot com. Get your merch there. Check out for the trips. Go to or check out contact at the cabin dot com. All right. Yep. All right, guys. Good night. Excellent Good to show, see you, and I'm looking forward to hanging with you guys next week. Yeah. Heck yeah, man. Like, oh, yeah. Last week. Yeah, good last right. week. Yeah, I'm looking forward <laughs> to hanging out with you guys last you. week. We so. had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome, Randall. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.